He's an icon to some and a pain to others, and now he's the author of a tell-all book. Dick Falkenberry, rise above it all, right here tonight on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmer. Dick, welcome back. It's so much fun always to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So what's it like to write a book, rise above it all? It went fairly easily because all you do is uh, kind of go back over your memories of what happened uh, with the rise and fall of the Seattle monorail project. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially your baby from the beginning. I wrote the initiative and, and then some other people and myself got it on the ballot. Uh, I think the Seattle voters wanted it so much. You know, it wasn't particularly difficult. We actually had almost no campaign. The <laughs> problem was that when, when we tried to actually build the monorail. And we're going to get there, but you know, the Seattle voters wanted it so much and actually the New York Times even thought this was really pretty cool because here it was. Their headline, their headline in 1997 was, or else give Seattle voters the last laugh. Yeah, Timothy Egan wrote a nice piece about us. Uh, what we were talking about was the notion that we were trying to build a transportation system from the ground up rather than from the top down. We were telling the leadership what we wanted rather than asking or accepting what they had sent from above. Mm -hmm. By the way, for those of you who are watching and, and tell everybody else as well, there's no way we're going to be able to get to everything that's in the book or even close. But Dick Falkenberry will be available June the 3rd at a forum at Town the Hall. Uh, again, that's June 3rd starts at yeah, well, I'll be there at 5.30 when, when the and I'll, open. I'll speak at 6.30 and I'll be around until late Asking evening. Asking a bunch of questions and all, but he, he will be there and we'll be showing that up throughout the show. All right, so we had the New York Times right. and uh, we put that up, but I went hunting around in, here in the Seattle Times in local papers for what the Seattle Times headline was and this is actually the best headline that I could find, which is that things are still up in the air for the monorail. So here the New York Times saying good things about it, and Seattle Times is basically poo-pooing it. Yeah, the Seattle Times was a champion of, of uh, the light rail, commuter rail uh, program of sound transit. And also, I don't think they ever got their, their whole mind around the monorail concept, the, how important it was. It could make a profit. It would not have fatalities. It would be on time. It would actually move people. And all of those are in contrast to all other mass transit systems. They aren't particularly efficient. They aren't profitable. And these monorails, because they have their own right-of-way, don't get into accidents, don't strike people, cars, other things. And because of that, they also get there on time. But it just wasn't one election. It seemed to be multiple elections. You know, fast forwarding to 2002, this is out of actually The Stranger because again, I went to the Seattle Times and I really couldn't find a good headline out of that, but Monorail wins. And even with this, there's a bit of a comic aspect to it. Yes, uh, one of the problems is that uh, I unfortunately have a, a desire to, to be, uh, shall we say, flippant sometimes. So for example, one of the stations had to be within 400 yards of the nose of the monorail of the Fremont Troll. A perfectly legal thing to do, but uh, people seem to, to grasp those kinds of things and, and, and run with them. On the other hand, the stranger, uh, even interestingly enough, in the first election in 1997, uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually opposed the monorail. Really? But then as soon as it passed, they embraced it with, with uh, both printing presses. All right, so it passed. There was a, I think it was called the Elevation, Elevated Transportation, Transportation Company. Company. And there was a reason for that, ETC, etc. We were instructed to do anything that we needed to to make the system work. Who, who, who is the we in that instructed you? The initiative. Oh, the initiative actually allowed us as an authority to build things like multiple sta uh, storied stations uh -huh. to partner with private people so that, for example, out in Ballard, you would build above the uh, Sunset Bowl. And then the Sunset Bowl would have 40,000 people that could get to their, their facility. Sunset Bowl. The bowling alley there at uh, approximately 14th and Market, which has now been replaced it's by gone. apartments. Yeah. Gone. As are many other uh, ground level things in Ballard. Ballard. Ballard's also changing, but. Yeah, well, I look, Dick, I freely admit to being to being in favor of the monorail at the time, you know, through, you. through every single election that right. there was, and primarily it was because of this, because I did just a tiny bit of research, and monorails around the world, even if you Americanize the dollars, they were still 25 million to maybe 50 million dollars max a mile. What but I then when, this group got hold of it, it exploded. Why? 
What happened was Joel Horn uh, came on board first as a, a board member, then as a staff, then as executive director. In addition, uh, Tom Weeks became the chairman of the board mm -hmm. of the monorail project. And these two people uh, really in their hearts wanted to build the monorail, but the way they saw to build a transportation project, any public works, whether it's Brightwater sewage treatment plant or the viaduct tunnel replacement, 520, you build it as big as you can. My joke was is that when Joel Horn got to a fork in the road and this way was less expensive and this was more expensive, he would build a third way of the most expensive possible solution. And he did that over and over and over again, both in the capital production and in the operations and even the financial transactions were well, very expensive. The Seattle Weekly in 2006 uh, has a headline. It says, Joel Horn's blank check. And there's a great quote in, in this, and actually it comes from a resident of uh, Crown Hill who had been a monorail proponent. Uh, she says this, but worst of all, there was the secrecy and the arrogance of the monorail board and staff in response to the concerns of the neighborhoods or in response to any group that did not fully agree with them. Is that true? Partially true. The problem was that Joel Horn actually kept things away from the monorail board. For example, when the project if you will, collapsed of its own weight, of its cost. The board chairman at that time had not been shown the final pricing document until the last two weeks. Really? She, yes, she did not see the details of why things cost so much. And even many people on the staff were kept ignorant. If that wasn't part of their particular project, they were not told about that. Yeah, but and if Joe Horn was a transportation expert, then why should he be telling everybody else? because he's a public transportation expert. You must be transparent. And also, somebody would have tricked to this idea that he was driving up the cost to build both contractor uh, approval and union and uh, labor in general approval. He was going to hire 157 people for 13 trains which had no driver. That's borderline criminal, it's it's insane. Well. There's more that you talk about with the numbers, and you know sure. we're, we're, we we don't want to make people's no, eyes glaze no, over no, with a bunch no. of numbers. But 157 high-paid employees for 13 trains and no drivers, but no one, including the janitor, under fifty thousand dollars a year. Yes, I think Joel Horn and a lot of other people would agree with him that the one of the great generators of the middle class in America in the last 20 years has been government employees. And so they felt that there was no reason to hire somebody, even as a cleaner of the train, for less than middle class wages. Well, is that a bad thing? The way he did it was bad. First, he had way too many cleaners. I believe he had about a dozen cleaners. Secondly, out at the airport, the Port of Seattle does not clean the concourse of the airport. The concourse is cleaned by the advertisers because they want a clean site for their advertising. Mm -hmm. They pay nothing. The government pays nothing to clean the airport. I didn't the, know that. No, the airport is cleaned by the advertisers. And that's that public-private partnership which can work. You can also make it a bad situation. But in many cases, you make it a good situation by letting the private people hire the people to take care of the public problems. Hmm. By the way, again, if you wanted to uh, hear more about the book or actually ask Dick some questions yourself, June the 3rd at Town Hall. He'll be there at 5.30. He's going to start speaking at 6.30 again, June the 3rd, 2013 at Town Hall. Uh, we're going to put up Dick's website, dickfalconberry.com, several times throughout. You can find out more information there. We're getting back to these 157 high paid employees, the top five, a million bucks? Yeah, they were going to be paid more than the governor of the state of Washington and more than the mayor of Seattle, though that, that might be not too bad. But yeah, they were being paid a tremendous amount of money, I believe 265000 for the top person. So now, one of the other problems is this should be a situation where much of this is automated and, as I said before, taken over by private people. So if Sunset B Bowl built the station on their property, they would probably also manage that station. So there's no need for someone, this is not a, a complicated business to do, this is just a, simply a matter of finding the right people to partner with mm -hmm. on the one hand, and a lot of this should be automated. Why are we talking about this now? I mean, this is all in the past. 
No, it's also right now. Uh, we are building projects right now in which we have chosen the most expensive alternative. The viaduct tunnel, I know, has been talked to death, but we chose the most expensive alternative there. Uh, we 520 bridge is uh, outrageously expensive, mm -hmm. and again, we chose uh, a very expensive program there. Again, though, all in the past. I mean, you, no, no, these things are going on now. Yeah, but I know, but you're okay. using past tense. We've already made those decisions, so we're stuck with them, are we? Uh, and how about other cities? Let's you know, let's talk about what's going on in this city right now with the uh, uh, wastewater retention ponds that they're building. These are, are to catch the runoff from the streets before they enter into the sewage system and overflow the sewage system which then put into the fresh into the water the problem is we're paying thirty dollars a gallon for these retention uh, ponds we're building they're building one in Seward Park which is going to cost over ten million dollars I believe mm -hmm. they're going to have to bring in dynamite to dig this dig the, uh, the the holes in the ground to hold these water tanks mm -hmm. when what they could do is build either much smaller they could also uh, channel the water in a different way. We can do all kinds of things, but they are going at the most expensive possible uh, runoff mm -hmm. retention systems available. There's more though that, that when we're getting back to the monorail, it wasn't just the 157 high paid employees. It was something out of the design, we, and we're not gonna have a whole bunch of documents in the show, no, but, good. but something out of the design and build price summary is this thing called suppliers project management. Almost $70 million for project management. Isn't that what the 157 employees were supposed to do? No, actually this is on the capital side of things and you're not even talking about $70 million for the, cap, the project management for the entire system. This is simply for the trains. The 13 trains which would arrive probably in a box would be put on the tracks and this is not even for the propulsion part, nor for the, uh, for the controls. Uh -huh. This is simply $70 million given to these people, largely what we might call a consulting fee, simply as a gimme of a gift. But weren't you on the monorail board? No, at that time I wasn't, but remember, nobody on the monorail board was not only shown these kind of numbers, we were not allowed to go into the meetings, we were not allowed to talk to the contractors. Not at all. And we were at who, who was keeping Joel him? Horn told us not to talk. In fact, I had been told that I could go into any meeting. When I did, I was told I could not go into any meeting. In fact, I could go into no meetings. So I asked Joel Horn. I said that I had to hear that personally from Joel Horn. He came down and told me I could not go into the meeting. And that's because you were in, in, you were on the board at that time? At that time, I was on the board. A board member who is in, was not who, allowed to go into the meetings. Wow. At all. A or to even talk to these people. Now the contractors, Was that I because heard, of the, uh, uh, the Hol provision? Horn wanted to keep it everything secret. He was saying that there were uh, industry secrets, there were industrial sort of espionage going on, and that, that they were fearful that I would, I would somehow leak this information. Was it just you or was it any board member? Any board member. Was no, no, none of the board members were allowed. So, I mean, as I recall, one of the board members was a professor of the University of Washington. Was, yes. was that board member uh, going to be leaking it out as well? I don't think any of us would have leaked it out. For one thing, we wouldn't have. First thing, it's it's fairly mundane industrial information. I mean, it's an electric motor with rubber tires. Uh, well, I, you know, forgive <laughs> me, but as yeah. a taxpayer here in yeah. the city of Seattle, seventy yeah. million dollars for a consulting fee is not necessarily mundane to me. No, it's not at all. In fact, that goes on in every single contract for every single part. So, in other words, those people building the foundations, they got a, pro, a, a project management fee usually about two-fifths of the price in every aspect of every part of the capital program. So for example, the ticket machines people, they got millions, tens of millions of dollars for ticket machines, which they have built over and over again. They have 100,000 of these machines mm, out wow. in the world. There were some other things that were interesting about this. Um, <laughs> the monorail columns, you, right. had, you have talked, and you talk about it in your book, right about how the monorail columns were basically as cookie cutter as a friend of, of ours here at Public Exposure calls it trains on a stick. Yeah. But instead, um, Joel Horn wanted to turn it into an art project? Again, you have a, 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 the third way. You have a, 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 
a, a way you could do it in which you pour them on site and lift them into place. Probably less expensive would be to pour them off site and bring them in at night and put them in place. What he came up with was a complex scheme. First thing he did was he raised them from 20 feet high off the street to 40 feet, probably doubling or tripling the cost of the track. Why was that? The idea is that when you leave a building or step out of a, a storefront, your eyes only go up about 30 feet. So the idea was that this would somehow miraculously remove the track from our vision. The problem is... Oh, because they're ugly? The problem is that that is assuming well, that we, they're we, ugly. We're going to have some scenes from uh, the monorail in Sydney, Australia. Right. That, that thing's beautiful. Even if it's not beautiful, for example, we are all accustomed to looking at streets. Now, if you were to go into a park and dump concrete on the ground, you would be arrested for throwing hazmat material. We, we have become accustomed to the brutality of in transportation infrastructure. Sometimes it can be beautiful. Golden Gate Bridge, I would argue the Aurora Bridge is a beautiful structure. Mont Lake Bridge is a beautiful structure. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to build ugly. But also the idea that this is intrinsically ugly. In other words, anything up in the air is ugly. I it's, think is wrong. You know, it's interesting though because when you see pictures of Seattle, you see two things. First, you always see the space, space needle. needle. But second, 600 feet up in the air, so that blows away the idea that you're only looking up 30 feet. But second, the monorail. That's what you see. I think the Smith Tower is a good example. Smith Tower is a skyscraper. It was one of the very first skyscrapers, uh -huh. and yet it is not only uh, not ugly, it is in fact graceful. Just want to remind everyone, we're talking with Dick Falkenberry, who is the author of a new tell-all book, Rise Above It All. And you can find out all kinds of information on uh, dickfalkenberry.com. Go to the website there, and you're also going to find out the information about June 3rd at Town Hall, where he's going to be speaking. And you can ask questions, Rise Above It All, why did the monorail fail here? And I, I'm asking you that. Was it a failure of the technology? Is the technology bad? Oh, no. No. The technology that we had approached it with, and I made some terrible mistakes in this in the initiative. Like for example, what? I called for an elevated, rubber-tired train. I should have just been blunt about it and saying we want the all-wig monorail. Mm. Secondly, I should have uh, partnered with a private person to build the monorail from the very beginning. Uh, the problem was I was a cab driver at the time. I didn't have a lot of access to pr uh, public com uh, private companies. Thirdly, though, I really should, what we should have done as a board, and I should have insisted on it was, we should have put out a request for qualifications and a request for proposals with a nice oh, million dollar buy-in. Hitachi, Bombardier, several others would have sent in the money, and we would have funded our own study. In fact, there wouldn't have been a study, it's just a question of which of these proposals do we pick. Mm -hmm. And we could have been up and running in six months as we were supposed to be. The problem was, and I wrote a bad initiative. So you're taking the blame for it, even though you're one. You're not the one that had the seventy million dollar consulting fee. You didn't even know about it. You're not the one that had the forty feet high in the air, and you're also not the one that required sixteen maintenance maintenance trucks for thirteen trains. We had eight fully equipped, stocked, completely with tools, repair trucks, and six, eight other vehicles. So we had sixteen vehicles for 13 trains. And what you do, instead of all that nonsense, first thing, monorails very rarely break down. Yeah. The Haneda monorail from Tokyo to the Haneda airport has in 50 years moved a billion people and has never had an unscheduled stop on the tracks. Wow. No fatalities, no accidents, no injuries. So you don't need 16 repair vehicles. What you really need is a really good contract with Les Schwab to take care of the tires, <laughs> seriously. Well, and yeah. then you need and you need a contract with somebody like uh, Pacifica Marine, who d works with uh, uh, mass transit vehicles. And once a year, they come out and they make sure the vehicles are okay. You know, if I were a skeptical person, I would just say that this is another example of runaway graft and corruption, uh, or graft and corruption in a runaway uh, government agency. But I'm not. How did this these 16 maintenance trucks? get in the budget. Joel Horn and, and Tom Weeks, I believe, had no personal corruption at all. I don't believe that they uh, were looking for, that's, that, that's preposterous in, in any number of ways. If we had an hour, I could explain all that. 
I do, do believe from, the from their action is, is that they, what they were doing was they were uh, uh, trying to build an empire of both construction uh, contracts at the one end and labor at the other. And with this, they could then expand, take over much of Sound Transit program, go over to the east side, mm -hmm. go down to the airport, go out north maybe to Payne Field, and then you start building more and more, and, you, and, and, and I think that's what they wanted to do. The, the cost of the monorail uh, under Joel Horn's leadership got to be upwards of $140, $150 million a mile, somewhere in, in that uh, incredible range, three times as much as even the expensive ones in other parts of the world. But so while the costs are going up, you always felt like that there were opportunities for revenue that, under Joel Horn's leadership, you weren't taking such as advertising. Advertising is, is the, is, uh, to, pardon, to take a phrase from Christina Hill used it frequently, uh, the, the loaf hanging fruit. Yeah. That's the very first day. In fact, we could have had advertising on our construction vehicles. Hmm. As these columns go up and down I-5, we could have great advertising on the side of those vehicles. We could have had advertising on the forms. Think of how many times those forms would have been filmed Think about when they built the Safeco, when they built uh, Kingdom, and day after day they would go down there to show you the 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 uh, uh, how fast, how well they're moving along, and not, so we could have had advertising. Mm -hmm. You yes, never other, make, other cities do that. Oh, so. absolutely. I I don't think I've ever seen it on the construction forms so. mm -hmm. though. But let's talk about the fact that you cannot make money. Almost nobody makes money just on the fare box. You make money not selling the ticket to the passenger, you make money selling coffee to someone who had bought a ticket waiting for the train. There's much more profit. That's one reason why we're opening Starbucks every day, but we open very few transit systems. Now the other thing you do is, you take that entire model and you Googleize it. In other words, you're bringing together uh, 20 million people a year who are in your stations, who are waiting for a train, who have time, et cetera, and you sell that market. You sell that market to people like FedEx drop-off boxes for things like uh, when, when you had to return videos. But you also do it for things like public libraries. I would love to have a public library above a monorail station. You do it for things like not only coffee, but for uh, specialty bakeries, like maybe a Lebanese candy bakery. Mm -hmm. And remember that since you know a train's going to be there in five minutes, you're starting out in Ballard. And you're going down to, say, the King Street Station area, where we have a station. Yep. But along the way, you like that Inner Bay Bakery. There's a little bakery at the Inner Bay Station. Now, if you're on a city bus, there is no way you're going to get off that bus, go to the bakery, and come back and catch the next bus downtown. Right. You're, a, you're down an hour. But in this one, you could step out, buy something at the bakery, and then go back and get on the next train, which is a minute later, and continue on your way. I wish I could say the same thing, however, about uh, on the ground rail, uh, which we just have have had crash after crash here. We just had a fatality a few weeks ago. And, and fortunately, we we haven't had that many fatalities. I mean, we've had far less than other cities. And and that's and that's a good thing. But as we go through pictures of crashes, they. Even even ones like the the one at the very end, which is basically just a little fender den, uh, bender. Right. What does this do? The problem with light rail is it has two problems that are very bad in urban transportation. It cannot swerve and it cannot stop. That's very bad in an urban environment. Oh. So that. Uh, so that's going to reduce the the how fast you can go too. It's going to reduce it to uh, the nationwide F federal transportation administration. Uh, s the average surface light rail is 14 miles an hour, which is one mile an hour better than a bus. So you're spending over $50 million a mile to achieve one mile an hour faster. The problem with these type of fender benders or even the larger accidents is not only is the train shut down going to the south, but it is also shut down to the north. These, these people are not going to move until we have solved this problem in the sense of totally ascertaining that that person driving that white vehicle is at fault. Oh. Because otherwise they will sue us for $10 million. And we have cameras in front of that train. 
and all that, they are going to be there. There's five or six supervisors there. There are several police officers, many more. If your car had hit that car, you would not have three police officers there. Trust me, there's no way. So not only do you shut down the system, you have to use a lot of other resources, and then, uh, and then they'll go away. This sounds a lot like, in the explosion of the cost, and the massive bureaucracy that, that was being built around it, it sounds like kind of the dastardly deeds that developers do. And yet if we go to this next picture out in Ballard right now, as we, as we sit, there are two areas, and we've got them up on the screen, that, that are being developed yeah. that started back during the monorail days. As I understand it, uh, Joel Horn and someone else visited the one on the left there, the completed structure on the far left of the left circle, and they said, by the way, the monorail station's gonna be here in three years, so you wanna buy your condominium now. The problem is we have built two huge apartment complexes with transit-oriented development, but we forgot to provide the transit. And, and the rapid ride simply has not uh, been as efficient as we were hoping. Well, someday it'll be there though, right? I doubt it. Uh, first thing, to build a light rail out to Boward, there's, there's no obvious corridor. And secondly, if you go over the canal, you have to build a massive structure. Remember, I mean a massive structure. It's going to be over 27 feet wide. And the problem with that too is, how do you absolutely guarantee that nobody else will drive up there? So now you have a number of problems. Whereas a monorail is only three feet wide, nobody else can drive on that, and you don't have to worry about a drunk looking at a wide open 27 foot wide structure and saying, I can do that, I can get up there. Yeah, well, we got, unfortunately, we've got 15 seconds left and I gotta get to this. Uh, 2005 headline, monorail dream reaches the end of the line. How was it for you? It was bittersweet. I had left the board probably, again, making a mistake, I'd left the board because I just felt I wasn't able to uh, uh, do much on the board. I was being voted down 11 to 1. The real problem was that the board should have simply done what Sound Transit did. When Sound Transit found out that their budget was 100% over budget going out to the university, they asked for and received two years to straighten it out. So unfortunately, Dick, that's got to be also. Just as a reminder, June 3rd at Town Hall on the lower level, Dick Falkenberry will be there talking about the monorail, answering your questions starting at 530. DickFalkenberry.com. We'll see you right here next week on Public Exposure. Take care.